I had started notes on this subject, I think probably four or five months ago, and I never finished it. And then someone brought this subject to me a couple of times in the last week, and we were comparing notes. And I came to realize that there's very, very little understanding of this subject biblically. It's a critical subject, but very few people know anything about it. They don't have, it, it really isn't taught. And so I'm going to address accountability. So the Bible does have a lot to say about it. And if you Google um, Bible versus accountability, you'll see there's a lot that God has said about accountability. And the Bible is clear that accountability is not just a great idea, it is an expectation from God that we are all accountable to each other as Christians. And biblical accountability actually means that we give an account according to a clear standard of God's word within personal relationships, but also ultimately to him too. So he's the one who sets the standard and the most obvious part of accountability is giving account. And many today don't want this. They don't have this in their relationships because they don't want this. It's not accountability if there's no expectation of someone being able to ask you the hard questions that require you to give an honest answer. Anything other than that is not genuine accountability. So most people do not want that for various reasons. The Bible details how we will give account to God at the end. It says in Romans 14, 12, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Matthew 12, 36 says, but I tell you that men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they have spoken. So not just deeds done and left undone, because there's sins of commission, which means the ones we do, but there's also sins of omission, which means things we did not do. So if God called us to do a certain thing for him, had a destiny for us, and we chose not to, and just live this life for our own pleasure, we completely omitted the call of God on our life. That is a outrageous sin against God. That will come up there also. But he also calls it down to every careless word. He's, um, he's extended us so much that we're stewards of what he has given us. We weren't placed here on earth to be our own master. So he's only operating justly according to how he created us so that people have decided that they want to live by their own design. That really wasn't an option that was ever given. It's just one that man has created for himself even inside the definition of Christianity especially in our country Hebrews 4 13 says no creature is hidden from him but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account and these verses show how we will be held accountable our words our deeds every choice made is recorded whether or not we make ourselves accountable in this life we will all stand and be accountable to God no exceptions for the next every detail of our lives will be shown with its motive and so because God sees this relationship if we call ourselves Christians this is about Christians it's not about unbelievers um, in this case so if we call ourselves Christians, that's a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we're not really a Christian. A true Christian is a Christ follower in a covenant relationship, a born again covenant relationship with Jesus Christ equal to the standards of marriage, not according to our own definition, but according to God's definition. So it should not be surprising that those of us who 
are in a marriage don't want your spouse keeping secrets and doing things that they don't want to be asked about. So God is saying he has the same right in this relationship because this is the very nature of our relationship to him if we are genuinely his is the same as what actually higher level but we are fully accountable to him and when the word world talks about accountability there's such a crazy varied standard just depends on who's talking about accountability and unfortunately because that line keeps moving and that bar goes up and down christians use this murky model for their accountability as well each person when they decide there's accountability they write up the definition of how that's going to work but that's not how the bible speaks of accountability it's based on one standard and that is the word of god any accountability for christians isn't up to our view of how it should look it is only god's word that is allowed to be the standard romans 2 12 says that all people are held accountable to god's word to the level that they understand it it says all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law and also who sin under the law will be judged by the law basically the more you know the greater your level of accountability. So for especially those who are churched, everything we know that we've read in the Bible or that we've heard, anyone who has heard the truth, you're accountable for everything you've heard. So you can no longer claim ignorance on any of it. It's just a choice of whether you choose to obey, whether you choose to believe, whether you choose to apply it to your life. That's, you know the truth, it's in you. God knows that, so now it's what, what you chose to do with it. In Romans 2.15, Paul shows that everybody has a certain level of accountability because God wrote his law on each of our conscience. And they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts either accuse or excuse them. Basically, there's no way around it. We are all accountable. We know right from wrong. That's what God wrote on our hearts. We know right from wrong. There's many things that we may do or say around our peers that we would never do or say in front of a spouse or our children or the pastor, the person we want things from. There's, we all know what's acceptable and appropriate and what isn't. Biblical accountability does not mean we tell our secrets and our sins to every person that we meet. The level of accountability varies. It depends on the relationship and there's different levels of that from peer level to um, leadership level to there's different windows for that. Matthew 18, 15 says, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If the brother refuses to listen, you can involve more and more people in the process. It's the same when seeking accountability for our own actions. Accountability starts by admitting our sin to the people most affected by it. We involve more when we seek help, when we're asking people to help us become restored, to right standing with God and with others. So at that point, it becomes a bigger group because if we're using biblical accountability, we're doing it with the momentum of, I'm bringing this back under submission to God. Accountability is very critical to overcoming sin. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 explains some of the practical reasons. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if one falls down, his companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? And though one may be overpowered, two can resist. Moreover, a cord of three stands is not quickly broken. And Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron and one person sharpens another. And this entire subject of accountability fails whenever we don't practice biblical accountability. So any other standard, it's gonna fall apart because there is no real standard besides that. It doesn't 
If it isn't complete, it becomes ritualistic without any real power or purpose. And these and many other things completely and ultimately fail when we, we refuse to know and follow God's clearly written out plans for living out our calling as a community. He's calling us to be responsible to and for each other. Accountability is very freeing when it's done in truth, but it becomes further bondage when it's done in lies and deception. And prayer is a very necessary part of that. So we all know when we've asked someone a question and they've lied to us about the answer, we all know what that feels like and we all know that breaks a relationship. So it leads to much worse things when lies and deception are allowed to be part of accountability. Ephesians 4.15 says, Speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. And a big part of biblical accountability is speaking the truth in love, not just confessing our failures one to another or calling out sin, but speaking the truth. And in Psalm 32, 3 through 4, David says, When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was drained as in the summer heat. So this is what happens when someone's harboring sin in their life and they're not speaking about it. They're not being held accountable. We're sharing and making ourselves accountable. So sharing our sin to someone who isn't going to berate us brings freedom and relief, but not doing so makes you exhausted and oftentimes depression sets in very quickly because all these toxic thoughts and emotions build and build and build inside of us. They cause us to become sick. Oftentimes this leads to death in some way or another. This is will easily cause suicide. It causes a lot of different crimes, but it also causes a lot of major sickness since um, our thoughts produce a lot of sickness. Biblical accountability isn't just concerned about what someone did or didn't do. It's also concerned with the why, the motive of the heart. And these are often connected to deep emotional wounds from our past. Therefore, repentance should bring you to wanting to know the root so that you can clean that up so that it doesn't continue to produce more sin. Author Scott T. Brown, who's president of Church and Family Life, writes that 1 Timothy 5, 19-21 shows nine ways that church elders are to be held accountable. So within the body of Christ, you've got two different standards. You've got the leaders of the church or the leaders of the ministry, any um, functioning um, organization that's um, calling itself a ministry or coming under the umbrella of Jesus. There's a standard for the leaders, but there's also a standard for the members. So I'm going to do both standards. I'm going to give both standards that the Bible gives. And I am going to just stay right on track because it's important and I want this to to be clearly, um, I don't want this to be confusing because this is not welcome in most churches, most ministries, it's not welcome. People don't wanna hear it, that's why you don't hear about it because people don't want it. But if the church is following the Bible, this will be in place. And if it's not following the Bible, if it's following the Bible in other ways, but not this way or this other way because people don't want that, you have a problem with the church because, again, this is, a, this is the bride of Christ. And when you have a bride who is 95% faithful, you have a bride who is not faithful. So no one wants to marry someone who's promising to be 90 or 95 or even 99 percent faithful no one wants that and god will not accept that we wouldn't accept that so if your church is not following the standard for accountability given in the bible i would certainly want to know why not but it's very important that it is followed 
and there's reasons why, which I will get into. Here are the nine points that he gives, and I will state them the way he states them for clarity. One is personal responsibility. Paul makes it clear that church members have a very specific role within the church. Every church member has the divinely appointed right and responsibility to bring a charge against a church elder when it is necessary. Every person in the pew has this responsibility. Many church members are not aware that the Bible explains that they have this role in dealing with sin in the lives of their elders. And as a result, in our modern church environment, this is one of the most ignored aspects of local church life that is mandated in the Bible. This is especially unfortunate since church members are intimately connected to one another as family. This connection in Christ obligates them. There are several levels of this relational obligation. One of the most obvious of these relational obligations is that as brothers and sisters, we are called to fulfill over 50 one another's in the Bible. As family members, we are accessible only to speak the truth in love. However, it must be performed in an orderly and biblically prescribed manner. Um, two, for the elders, they are held to a stricter judgment. It is immediately evident from 1 Timothy 5.20 that God has designed his church to have a very specific set of rules for dealing with the church elders when they sin. And these procedural commands are obviously focused on leaders, not the wider church. Eldership carries with it greater risks for a greater number of people, and therefore they are subject to a stricter judgment according to James 3.1. James makes it clear that those who teach the word are under a magnifying glass of a higher power. They have a overseer in a much higher place. In this sense, church elders are treated differently and even more severely than those in the general congregation. With greater responsibility comes greater accountability and greater vulnerability to public rebuke three multiple witnesses. So holding church leaders accountable requires two or three witnesses. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses, the Bible says. Notice how the Lord has commanded that there be a careful process that includes the following elements. First, there must be a personal witness. Then in order to bring an accusation, that person is obligated to bring a minimum of one other witness. And this language implies lies a vigilant examination and verification process of the, exact, the accusation. This procedure is, des, is designed to protect the elder from trivial, false, and evil accusations. It also protects him or her from accusations based on rumors, gossip, or internet slander. It's part of the territory because as leaders, there's often criticism and targets since leaders are human and people don't like certain doctrines and the best of people can be picked apart on minor things. Furthermore, leaders are often subjected to unrighteous criticism because the standard to which they're held is often higher than many of them can meet. It's common for church members to fall into merciless criticism because leaders are sinners, have weaknesses, and inadequacies. However, the process commanded by God in 1 Timothy 5 protects leaders from unnecessary accusations by immature, unnecessarily offended, or envious parties. So that, the process God has designed is very protective of how this has to happen. The requirement Paul outlines here is obvious only for flagrant, public, or scandalous sins. If the sins are private and lesser in nature, then the rebuke should be less severe and spoken in private between brothers. However, if a public rebuke for serious sin is to be delivered, it must be upon the testimony of two or three witnesses. And these witnesses are evaluated. Oops, sorry. These witnesses are evaluated. Um, hold on, I <laughs> just jumped ahead. Uh, 
And if found to be truthful, then the rebuke is required. The foundation for Paul's command is found in Deuteronomy 19.15, where Moses communicates the law of witnesses. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning an iniquity or any sins that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So he establishes a careful and orderly environment where hard evidence is gathered, not rumors, and testimony is examined. Four, partiality is avoided. Paul makes it clear that there must not be any partiality. He says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Partiality has many faces. Sometimes it expresses itself when there is a very gifted elder and because of his charisma, persuasiveness and position, People hold him to a lower standard when they should be holding him to a higher standard. And it may be manifested in a desire to continue seeing the benefit of his life. We may think that he has done so much good that it will all be lost if we hold him accountable. Sometimes partiality is promoted by thinking that many people will be hurt, so I will not say anything. It's going to cause people to fall away from God. Or it will be so hard on his family. We don't want to hurt his wife and children. It's better to just keep it quiet and not cause all this damage. I've heard people say he's such a great fundraiser that nobody touches the things going on in his personal life because he brings in so much money. I've heard that excuse. Some people may even fear reprisal, rejection, or forever broken relationships if they hold someone accountable in leadership. And this does happen. People are, are, people are treated terribly for coming forward. That's just a known fact. People are treated terribly. They often feel that the worst thing that can happen is that their relationship with the elder is broken. And this kind of partiality often occurs when church members have a low view of sin, a high view of themselves, and an unhealthy affection for outward appearance. That's when that happens. They feel that it would be too damaging to expose the sin when in fact, the worst thing that could happen is to be disobedient to the word of God so that the sin continues to grow in the darkness without confrontation. The body is only as healthy as the leader. Partiality is one of the great dangers to the proper fulfilling of Paul's commands because it is one of the sins in the church that facilitates elders who continue in their sin. We know from history of just crimes against members in the church that oftentimes it was widely known, it was confronted, it was brought forward, people were actually moved to a different congregation not people, the leaders. They were moved to a different congregation rather than put them out. It's, it's crazy what is covered up in the church forever back. Accountability for what happened. Paul is advocating in the fifth tra accountability for the sin in the phrase, those who are sinning, rebuke. This phrase means it, it presents a real challenge. As William Mounts observes, what appears initially to be straightforward in that verse actually has many interpretation problems. The argument is this, an elder must be rebuked only when he continues in a particular sin or sins. But if he has stopped the sin, then there's no need for rebuke. That's the way people get confused by how that's written. But while that interpretation is possible, it appears to be at odds with the purpose of the command to begin with. Further, this interpretation renders a rebuke an extremely rare occurrence when a leader sins. It makes the command nearly pointless for its lack of usefulness and almost unemployable as a command, except in very rare cases. In the, cases, in the case of sins of a financial or moral nature, for instance, the very act of getting caught almost always brings these sins to an immediate stop. For example, if a leader is caught embezzling funds from his church, the ability to embezzle is taken away the moment he is found out. He is therefore no longer continuing in the sin. Does this mean he should not be rebuked? Or if a man is caught in adultery, he usually stops. Does this mean there's no need to rebuke him? 
To maintain that rebuke is only an order when the sin persists renders Paul's command almost irrelevant. In order to avoid a rebuke, all the elder has to do is stop the sin for a while. The issue many agree is not if he is continuing in the sin or whether he is sorrowful over the sin, but rather that he is guilty of sinning. That's the real issue. So in many times when we see these pastors being exposed, it has time after time after time happened before, but because it was, con it was exposed, and it was confronted and they said they would stop, therefore no public rebuke was given. They were allowed to continue unchecked. In doing so, when they have sinned, they are no longer above reproach as required in 1 Timothy 3.2. So it does not matter whether or not the first time renders them no longer above reproach. What if the man says he repents does he then escape rebuke because he says he's repentant? So this verse gives no indication that repentance suspends rebuke. In fact, there's no mention of repentance in the whole text at all. Paul's instructions are very clear. The purpose of this rebuke is not to produce repentance in the leader, important as that may be, but to cause all to fear. The issue here is not excommunication, whether that happens or not. The issue is public exposure and reproof of one who holds a high office. No one gets a past in a church under Jesus Christ when it comes to sin, especially not its leaders. And while true repentance is a critical matter in the elder's relationship with the Lord, with his church, with his family, it is important to remember it is clearly stated that the purpose of the rebuke is not repentance, but the causing of fear. There is also a practical reality that must be considered in most cases when men are caught in serious sin. This applies to women also. They confess to what can be proven and they profess to be repentant to what can be proven. Nothing more. That often happens. Most often they cry and they express sorrow over their sin, but they're somehow cloaking it in words that say, well, we know, like, I did not actually have sex with them. They will somehow make it in a different phrase than just completely exposing wickedness against God and against their congregation. They somehow try to make it more um, or less. There is no repentance in that behavior. They will almost always ask to be forgiven. They will apologize. They will go to great lengths to communicate how profoundly they regret their sin. And this, um, the person who wrote this list said, he has been witness to many tearful confessions, only to find out later that there was no true repentance as evidenced by a changed life. They did not change their behavior. It would happen again. If repentance suspends the need for the rebuke, then the command would be very rarely put into practice. It would mean that the command to rebuke would only be applicable if the elder was belligerent, willfully continuing in public sin, just rebellious against the rules of God. But if he is now living a, if he says change life, I'm not gonna do it anymore, then he would not be rebuked. But if he's living an immoral life or he's embezzling and he's found out and he's stopped, many think the sin should be covered up. And this is most likely why Paul does not figure repentance into the equation of rebuke when the elder, elder is guilty. This perspective is carried out every day in our courts of law because many of our laws in America are based on the Bible, believe it or not. We use the same principle applied in the civil realm. When someone steals, they're held accountable regardless of repentance. And this is the same treatment Paul is prescribing for an elder. However, if the elder is hard-hearted and willfully continuing in his sin, then he's a candidate for excommunication, a discipline far more severe when compared to a simple rebuke. Paul's point then is this, when an elder's sin is discovered and verified, 
by witnesses, he must be publicly rebuked in order to produce in the hearts of his fellow leaders and his congregation a holy fear of sinning against God, which may or may not bring about repentance for the person who is sinning. Six, a rebuke. If the accusation brought by multiple witnesses establishes that the sin is real, a rebuke is required. The investigation process must reveal that the sin was not trivial. It must verify that the accusation was for serious sin, not the result of pickiness, harshness, a personal vendetta, envy, or critical spirit of the accusers. A rebuke is designed to expose and bring sin into the light. The word that Paul uses here speaks of exposing, convicting, disapproving, or punishing. The rebuke should be delivered according to wisdom. It should be measured according to the severity of the sin and the disposition of the offender. There could be a simple public rebuke or temporal removal or even excommunication depending on how many factors are involved. The punishment should be delivered according to wisdom. Seven, a public rebuke. This rebuke is to be delivered before the entire congregation in the presence of all. There's a tendency in many situations like this to try to protect the people from hearing what their pastor has done or their leader has done. And sometimes in an attempt to express sympathy or to act out of a sense of misplaced kindness, protect the family, that kind of thing. There's a private meeting for the church members only or a subset of the church. It's difficult to see how these approaches are appropriate applications of what the Bible says. The Bible says that the rebuke takes place in the presence of all. And this is understood to mean the entire congregation, not just before elders only, as some insist. Matthew Henry explains it this way. Those that sin before all, rebuke before all that the plaster may be as wide as the wound and that those who are in danger of sinning by the example of their fall may take warning by the re rebuke given so that others may also fear. So if an elder has a national or international presence, it may be necessary for that rebuke to go beyond the local congregation to cover the reach of the person's ministry. Therefore, Paul's use of the term all should be defined by the scope of influence with the rebuke extending across the full range of the leader's influence. It follows that if a local church leader is also a national leader, it is up to the local church to deliver a national rebuke. And the courage to cause fears, number eight. In today's church environment, church elders and members often prefer a very positive, upbeat church life um, seeker sensitive we want the whole community happy there free from guilt free from fear we don't want distraught and repentant atmospheres and in contrast to this Paul's stated purpose of the rebuke is so that the rest also may fear Paul uses very strong language to communicate this the word he uses to communicate the desired result indicates alarm and fright Paul desires that there be a fear of sin in the congregation. The good that comes from an elder's rebuke is that it causes all to search their own hearts and lives for any ongoing sin. And in this sense, the elder's rebuke is also their rebuke. It heightens godly fear of sin and it restrains wickedness. And in order for the congregations to have the courage to obey God in this, there must be an understanding in the congregation that this kind of fear is actually a good thing and that it, it accomplishes godly purposes. I just read a comment someone put on one of my posts where they find things so negative. They just don't like the whole negative slant of having people obey what God says. But the problem is if it's not resolved this side of heaven, there will be a severe accounting for it on the other side it is best to know what the bible says and do it if your heart is surrendered to jesus christ as what it is what a christian is like in your marriage 
you don't desire to hurt and wound that person. So there shouldn't be any anger or offense over why God wants to be treated honorably, respectfully, and he wants Jesus to be adored. There is absolutely no reason that we should side with sin, side with um, those who struggle to even want to stop sinning. There should be absolutely no support for that at all because the position you're taking, you have to ask yourself, who is it serving, the devil or Jesus? You have to ask that about each position you take. And in this case, when we make allotment for a continuation of sin or the covering up of sin or the protecting of someone's reputation in sin, we're serving the side of the enemy, especially in that person's life. I once had someone in authority over me who committed a crime against me and I went to the boss over that person and I said, I need your help. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not safe. I need your help though because this person had taken something from me. And this boss looked at me and he said, do you want him in heaven or in hell? Which kind of surprised me that he asked me that. I said, I, I want him in heaven. He said, well then, you're going to help me hold him accountable. And I said, well, I'm not sure. I came to you for help. He said, do you want to help him go to heaven? And I said, yes. And he said, then you're coming with me and we're going to the police station. He said, this man is like a son to me. I love him like a son. I will not allow him to continue to do this. I will not let him get away with this. You and I are going to the police station and we are going to press charges. I still get chills thinking about that moment and I will never forget it. That's accountability. That's what accountability looks like. Turning from sin ultimately brings about the well-being and happiness of the leader and the whole church. And a holy church is a happy church, but you have to operate under this mandate. James Denny writes, The judgment of the church is the instrument of God's love. And the moment it is accepted in the sinful soul, it begins to work as a redemptive force. The question is, do you or does your church have the courage to cause fear? That's the question. Nine, trembling at the seriousness of the matter. The requirement to rebuke must be regarded with utmost seriousness. The gravity of handling the matter properly is identified by a very sober warning. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. And it should startle us that nothing less than God, the Lord Jesus, and his holy angels are watching how we as leaders and churches deal with sin in our midst. These matters are spectacles to all of heaven who's watching what will you do? Baptist theologian John Dagg expressed this sentiment in these words. When discipline leaves a church or a ministry, Jesus goes out with it. Mary Fairchild teaches the correct way to deal with sin in the church body. And this is also expected by God in the church that is submitted to him. And again, a church submitted to him can't pick and choose which parts they're going to submit to. It is a full submission to the word of God, or again, it's an unfaithful spouse, not willing to be faithful in all things. Take note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. It says in 2 Thessalonians 
3, 14 through 15, stay away from them so they will be ashamed. Don't think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or sister. So church discipline is a biblical process of confrontation and correction carried out by individual Christians, church leaders, or the entire church body when a member of the body is involved in a matter of open sin. Church discipline is meant specifically for believers involved in overt sin, and scripture gives particular emphasis to Christians engaged in matters of sexual immorality, those creating discord or strife between members of the body of Christ, those spreading false teachings, and believers in outspoken rebellion to the spiritual authorities appointed by God in the church. And please note, this is not to be applied to those are, who are not yet claiming to be Christian. So people get kind of hyper crazy about this whole don't judge thing. But for those who actually read and know the Bible, they will see that is not at all how the Bible addresses sin in someone's life. So if you, I am one who came from great sin. I'm very open about how sinful my life was. But I can tell you that from early days of my salvation, which I was very vocal about also, that when I was saved, I was in a relationship. I had been in that relationship for four years. I was having a real hard time letting go of that relationship because I just was having a really hard time. And I was confronted about that a few times. And I feel warm just talking about this. I was confronted about that because by all means, I was giving an appearance of evil. So if you're claiming to be born again, and you are not sexually pure, you're living with someone of the opposite sex, you're both unmarried, you're giving the appearance of evil, that is to be confronted. God desires his people to be pure, and it's a line he draws that you cannot call yourself his and cross over into that area. He calls us to live holy lives. We are to be set apart for his glory. We are not to be putting our hands, our eyes on others that way when we're not married to them. I could not be more clear about this because I reap the whirlwind of consequences for what I see many doing today, which is somehow justifying that behavior. You cannot. And God really brought the ceiling down on me for that. And I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I'm lucky to be alive again. So I will tell you that if you want to go to heaven, you better take very seriously what the Bible says. Flee sexual immorality, including porn addiction, which is very much sexual immorality, because you will not enter heaven if you have not repented and turned from that choice. It has to be removed completely from your life as an option. First Peter 1.16 restates Leviticus 11.44 that says, Be holy because I am holy. And if we ignore, if we completely ignore that with blatant sinfulness within the body of Christ, we're in the church community, we're in the ministry community, we're going out ministering to others, we are not honoring God to live holy and live for his glory. And we are currently working with a young woman who has got the most vicious demon we have ever encountered and we have not been able to get it out. And we are really struggling with the process because we've never had this happen where we simply cannot figure out how to get it out. And how it's a sexual demon, 
by all appearances that's holding it all together and it says that it came into her through the laying on of hands which she said happened in a ministry so I would advise people to be very careful who lays hands on you and make sure that you know that they are in purity because this is why the Bible is clear with that warning about being careful who lays hands on you and that is exactly why and here she is getting her life completely spun out by this thing we're just trying to find obviously it's legal right to her but it's a mess we know Hebrews 12 6 that God says he disciplines his children he says for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives so in 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13, we see that he passes this responsibility on to the church family. It isn't our responsibility to judge outsiders, but it is definitely our responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but the Bible says you must remove the evil person from among you. That's what God says. And nobody really wants to hear that but the church will not outgrow the level of its obedience to God it has capped off the level it Jesus won't take it further than it's willing to go another vital reason for church discipline is to maintain the testimony of the church to the world and we all know this unbelievers are watching us we're the we're supposed to be the bright light in a dark world, a city set on a hill. And if the church looks the same as the world and the people in the church are running with the world, lured by the world, acting like the world, the witness has been destroyed. And that church is worth nothing. If the world has evangelized the church, the church is then the world's. You will know a church that is professing Christ in the right way and showing the power that he longs to have inside of the church because they discipline according to the Bible. And it keeps a great standard and it keeps Jesus Lord. When church discipline comes up it is never desirable it is certainly not easy but it is very necessary to fulfill God's intended purpose on this earth not only in that person's life but everyone who's watching everyone who knows I mean there's plenty of people that know these two people are constantly in the church they volunteer they're not married they live together that should not be the goal of church discipline is not to punish people who are failing on the contrary. The purpose is to bring the person to the point of godly sorrow and repentance so that they turn away from their sin and they are restored to a relationship with God and other believers, not allowed to continue on in sin and eventually to hell. It's the church that has to stop them. Individually, the intent is healing and restoration but corporately, the purpose is to build up, edify, and strengthen the entire body of Christ to the standard required by God. Matthew 18, 15 to 17 clearly and very specifically gives the practical steps for confronting and correcting a wayward believer in the church. One first, one believer, usually the person that has been sinned against, will meet individually with the other believer to point out the offense. If the brother or sister listens and confesses, the matter is resolved. Second, if the one-on-one -on -one meeting is unsuccessful, the offended person will attempt to meet with the believer again, taking with him one or two other members of the church. This allows the confrontation of sin and resulting correction to be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Third, if the person still refuses to listen and change their behavior, the matter is to be taken before the entire congregation. The whole church body will publicly confront the believer and encourage them to repent. 
And lastly, if all attempts to discipline the believer fail to bring change and repentance, the person will be removed from the church. And Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, that this final step in church discipline is a way of handling an unrepentant member, handing them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that their spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. So in in extreme cases, it is sometimes necessary for God to use the devil to work in a sinner's life to bring him to repentance. And I feel I have been under that before, and I have seen many others who have also. This is why people say it got so much worse, or they will talk about just the horror and the torment they are in that they wouldn't have been in had they been an unbeliever. God is allowing that because he does not want you to end up in hell. He wants you to throw down your sin. Galatians 6, 1 describes a correct attitude when people are exercising church discipline. It says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So gentleness, humility, and love are to guide the attitude of those who wish to restore a fallen brother or sister. Spiritual maturity and submission to the Holy Spirit are absolutely critical. This should never be an offended person doing that kind of thing. It should be people who can do this from God's perspective. Church discipline should never be entered into lightly or for minor things. It is a very serious matter calling for extreme care, godly character, and a true desire to see this person restored and the purity of the church maintained. And when the process of church discipline brings about the desired result, repentance, then the church must extend love, comfort, forgiveness, and restoration to the individual. And undoubtedly, dealing with such things is very difficult and affects the heart. However, the pain should not keep us from being faithful to God. That is the ultimate priority. And when we are faithful to God, the blessings of God will flow when the Bible is obeyed. It causes the power of the gospel and repentance to be known and seen in action. It causes sin to be purged in both leaders and congregation. It diminishes love for the world. It increases love for Jesus Christ. It heals, it warns, it restores. It causes the church to rise up and become the church. If the church isn't hungry to evangelize, hungry to care for the desperate around them, if they're not hungry to be out being the church, there's something wrong in this area. It is not being done. One time accountability is not biblical accountability. This is ongoing in relationships with persistent daily communication, oftentimes daily. It doesn't have to be daily. And too often accountability is treated as a last resort or um, the box we're going to put you in because of what you did. That is not how this is supposed to work. It is ongoing for everyone. We shouldn't look to accountability as a last resort when everything else has failed. But it's urgent to have accountability according to the Bible. And if you don't have it, you need to get it into your life now. The challenges of life and the world make it a necessity just for what you watch on TV, for what you um, see and observe in social media. We all need to be putting boundaries on ourselves because what goes into your eyes goes into your soul. Same with the ears. It, it's in your mind from then on. So we all need to be held accountable. And if you do not have biblical accountability, please establish it quickly. In a healthy church community, when there's accountability in place, there's a willingness to obey and submit to the leader's teaching and to the leaders. It is a trusted community. It's governed and trusted, and people know it. A healthy church will also realize there's another leader above themselves, the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore members and leaders know that they're under the scrutiny and the eyes of a loving God who's guiding this thing very carefully because he wants as many as possible to end up with himself 
He does not want them out playing in ditches. He pulls them up so he can have them for himself. And we should always long for his approval, not the approval of others, not our own pleasure. We must do our part to pay attention to what's being taught and how we are all living. And this can only happen when we set aside ourselves and we put forward the agenda of Jesus and his church in front of ourselves. And only then can we be in position to be used by God for the incredible display of power that he is desiring to show in these last days. He is waiting for this to happen. Precious Lord, you have really made this a big um, priority for me just because of my own self and just what can happen when you don't have it. I ask that you help us all. It is help us all, God, to be willing to be not just accountable to individuals, but our church body, our leaders, and yourself, that we would operate in purity and holiness and not make any more excuses for not doing it that we would throw down our sin and stop letting this wicked spirit flow through our churches because we won't put it out. Help us, God, to not be the ones that are causing others to become lukewarm. Light us on fire, Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit and burn the sin in us. Help us to hate it. Help us to get rid of it. Help us to want nothing more than to please you and to build heaven while we have a chance. I ask you personally to help me, forgive me, and help me to be the best I can be for you. That is all I want. I ask that you help us to be exactly who you created us to be and doing what you want us to do. We don't want to end up at the end knowing that we missed the mark so help us jesus i pray blessing over everyone that hears this and i pray that your holy spirit would bring healing to them would bring wholeness to them would bring holiness to them and purity to them in jesus name amen